Let's talk Giants. That whole Ross Cockrell signing where we all got all hot and bothered and we were all very excited about Ross Cockrell joining the, rejoining the ball club, being the second outside corner, providing us with some kind of consistency and stability at the secondary position of veteran presence who has decent grades from PFF, coverage grades and whatnot, playing again with his fellow teammate James Bradbury just seems like a match made in heaven. And then it just all fell apart over financial terms. A source says... No specifics about what the financial terms were that fell apart. I don't understand how you don't get that done. And then a sprinkler goes off. Okay, that's a really big bummer. I guess they ended up sending signing someone called Prince Smith. I don't know. I don't. I don't know anything about it. I tried to look him up in Pro Football Reference, and I got nada. So I can't even tell you much about Prince Smith. What I can tell you is that there have been every time I read an article or a blog about Darnay Holmes, I get that feeling few episodes ago, we talked about how Chris Williamson, I think the seventh rounder, or maybe he was a fifth rounder as well, the corner from Minnesota, uh, who played against Darius Slayton. People were saying he is the defensive version of Darius Slayton for the Giants, and I think it's it's more like Darnay Holmes. I think Darnay Holmes is going to be the guy who's going to open some eyes as a rookie and make the league take notice, sit up and take notice. Is he the outside corner? You know, we can go back and forth on that until kingdom come. But what was revealing this week or what was news to me is that all this time we thought that Julian Love was going to be the guy that's kind of roaming positionless, right? Is he a safety? Is it slot corner? Is he an outside corner? Now we're hearing that Jabril Peppers might be positionless and that he's not just a safety, that he could be used in an outside corner, that he could be moved into a slot in the box as a linebacker. Fuck, man. It could be all a huge smoke screen. Dave Gettleman is like Senior Sergeant Smoke Screen. Joe Judge comes from an organization that is like notorious for smoke smoke screening the fuck out of people. So it's it wouldn't be outside the realm of possibilities if they're just throwing this out there like, well, we don't know what position Jabril will play, and we don't know what position Julian will play, and we don't know what position so and so will play. I love it. I hope it comes true and comes to fruition and where it's not just a bunch of talk, like they actually do have these like crazy alignments that people are just scrambling to try to figure out. But very interesting. Should Jabril Peppers return kicks? Should he return punts? He was a running back in high school. He returned punts and kickoffs in college. And I think he had a couple of touchdowns, returned some for touchdowns. I'm hesitant. You know, I know Golden Tate was definitely uh, an upgrade as a punt returner last year, but he all, there are also a couple of scary moments where he gets clocked and you're like, I think you already have a concussion. <laughs> So I don't know that we really want you back there and, and get hurt when we're already thin at wide receiver. Don't know that I want Jabril Peppers getting hurt, returning punts and kicks. But at some point, you got to say, who gives you the best opportunity to win in what position? And just go with it. And if people get hurt, they get hurt. You can't live life in fear. And it's coming from a man who called the police after receiving a, a spam email. Yeah, so that's that's that with Ross Cockrell. I'd love to know more specifics, but I haven't really seen anything other than that. How bad could it have fallen apart? Has he signed with another team? Or can we just like come back to the table and negotiate a little more? DeAndre, ba so this is from NJ.com. DeAndre Baker is a dud, but these eight giants can bail out Dave Gettleman in 2020 and save his job. Holy sprinkler, that fucking thing is loud. It's like a fucking fire hose. Oh, did, did something actually blow up? And that's like, no. Okay. So eight. Giants who can bail out Dave Gettleman in 2020 and save his job because he's on the hot seat. First up, Golden Tate. Uh, the article says that he wasn't a high-impact player last season. Can he deliver more? Mm, I don't know about that. He played in 11 games. He came up with some big time plays against the Patriots, against the Eagles. I mean, he had some he had some nice plays that he he was able to reel off. Some big time catches. Would you like to see more of that? Obviously, yes. I think uh, it'd be great to get him over the course of 16 games and would be nice to have the whole crew healthy so that we're not just solely relying on him. He was an impact player, but he wasn't high impact. So I guess I agree with it. It was just like, it made it sound like he didn't make any impact. It's like, I don't know about that. Darius Slayton comes in at number two. Can he build on what, on what he achieved in 2019? Can he build on that in 2020? I say yes. I think Jason Garrett, I mean, this is... You know, a guy that Shermer had a weird way of playing. I mean, I, I disagree with Shermer's play calling 
most of the time. It was very rare. I was like, wow, that was a great play call. I probably had one of those a game with Pat Shermer. So uh, do I have more confidence in Jason Garrett? Yes, I do. And I think uh, Jason Garrett is already impressed with what he's seen from Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones is bulked up. And if you can get there, I mean, there was a stretch where you didn't have Darius Slayton and Golden Tate on the field at the same time. So it took him a while to gel and get some chemistry. But I think now that you got Slayton, Tate, and Shepard on the field at the same time with an offensive line, that looks like it might be turning the corner after we heard about uh, Nick Gates, what Mark Colombo had to say about Nick Gates. And yeah, maybe it's about a bunch of mouth service and hype from an offensive line coach who's trying to pump up their team. But it sounds like the team's not going to hand out an extension to an offensive lineman before the contract's up if they don't believe in him. And, you know, Colombo called Nick Gates an alpha male. And it's like, okay, so it looks like Nick Gates is our center getting the majority of his reps at center. It sounds like it's coming together. I've seen pictures of Matt Parrott where he just looks like a, a fucking man, a grown ass man with like a like Fu Manchu handlebar goatee and just like the longest arms created by, you know, a higher power. We're going to see a lot more RPO and I think we'll see a lot more of Slayton getting open and not disappearing. Uh, Andrew Thomas is the third player that can bail out Gettleman. And, uh, you know, I just have such a good feeling. I mean, Colombo has said that there's, after reviewing being introduced to Thomas live and in person firsthand and seeing what he's done so far in training camp, that he's the real deal. I have uh, a lot more confidence in him than I did Eric Flowers. <laughs> That's for sure. And and probably more than Nate Soldier at this point. So I read that him and Hernandez on the left side with the new uh, scheme for the run game are crushing it, which is great news. So I think Garrett has brought, a, a, Garrett and Colombo have brought a certain toughness and grit and fierceness to the offensive line again so they can become maulers like that offensive line in 2008 was that, that led to Earth, Wind, and Fire, Jacobs, Ward, and Bradshaw rushing for way more than 2,000 yards and route to home field advantage. So that's good news. Daniel Jones is the fifth player that can that can bail out Gettleman. There was a, I think from NFL.com said that there are two or a handful of players that are going to take up a huge step up in year two. And a lot of people are saying that Daniel Jones can be an MVP level quarterback, him and Kyler Murray, but that he'll outperform Kyler Murray. I can totally for sure see that and that's just not homerism y'all leonard williams leonard comes out and has uh and balls out and has you know between five and ten sacks I'd, I'd say even between five and ten sacks closer to ten would be nice there was a tweet i saw it's like pressures is a weird statistic sacks are sacks sack is a sack what is a pressure and i think it's very subjective a guy gets two feet within the quarterback the quarterback makes a throw and completes it. It's considered, I guess it's considered under pressure. Is that a pressure that goes to Leonard Williams? But ultimately did it, it didn't, it ended with the quarterback completing the pass. So it's like, cool, you got the pressure, but the, did the pressure affect the throw in a way that it, it forced an incompletion? Those are the kind of pressures I'd love to see versus the pressures that result in a quarterback completing the ball to his intended target for like a first down or a touchdown. Can we differentiate between the pressures? So if Leonard can get more of those pressures that end in incompletions versus completions, first downs, touchdowns, then uh, maybe you can make a case for extending him. Dexter Lawrence is the sixth player that can bail out uh, David Gettleman in 2020 and keep him around for another year or two. Uh, a lot of people saying that Lawrence is probably en route to a Pro Bowl this year. And it's good to hear. You know, Williams and Lawrence, it's just like if they are clicking and they're playing uh, at 100% of their potential, that's a pretty good interior defensive line. They rank, I think PFF ranked them as like among the top interior defenders. So we're pretty good on the interior. It's just like, can we figure out a scheme to get to free up some guys coming off the edge? James Bradbury is number seven. This is pretty obvious. Gettemann went out and spent some big bucks on him. So he's got to come in and perform. And it's kind of hard to not outperform what we had last year. So not too much pressure on Bradbury. And then Jabril Peppers is is the eighth player that can bail out Gettleman. And uh, this is because it's he's tied to that Odell Beckham Jr. trade, which there are reports that Odell Beckham looks like he's uh, superhuman this year. So, yeah, but it's training camp, folks. Mostly shorts and shoulder pads. Not a lot of hitting. Although the Giants 
out of everyone in the training camps, a lot more physical. And uh, Joe Judge has brought a certain mentality to the training camp and to the practices. And I'm all I'm all for it because we we have been soft. There have been people that saying like, oh, is he being like a hard ass and, you know, making players and coaches run, do laps if there's mistakes and, you know, running a much more physical type of practice with more hitting and collisions and whatnot. But you just listen to the guy talk and it just all makes sense. It's just like, yeah, not trying to hurt anybody, but this is a collision sport. There will be collisions. We have to prepare them for it and we have to make sure that they're safe when they do it. Uh, We can't go in there arm tackling guys. We have to put solid hat on football. I mean, I don't know how you're not head over heels in love with this dude. Everything he says just is like, yes, it's the perfect answer. <laughs> and yeah, sure, maybe it's just, you know, it's all PR and publicity and all. He's saying the right thing, but like ultimately it's about the product on the field and wins and losses. And if you, you know, what's his name? Emmanuel Acho, whatever, Echo, whatever, said that the Giants are going to go 2-14 and 14 because of Joe, Joe Judge's imbecilic approach to coaching. And it's like, imbecilic? The guy's teaching. He's teaching. Hands-on teaching. You see him trying to slap the ball out of players' hands as they're running by. Ball security. We cannot fumble the ball. And I know they're working with Daniel. The coaching staff is working with Daniel Jones on this, and really, fo- and which is tough because you know it was all virtual for a very long time with the spring into the early summer. So they weren't able to really do a lot of the drills that they had wanted to in person. But like it sounds like Skopinski, I think the quarterbacks coach, is really honing in on he's working on his internal timer and that uh, he's not holding on the ball too long, which can ultimately lead to fumbles in itself because you get hit from behind, whatever. You increase your probabilities of getting blindsided. But also the fact that he's bulked up and put, put on this muscle, he's going to have that better grip on the ball and it won't be it won't come out as easily. Everything I've seen, and I know this happens with training camp, at least with me. It's like, well, last year, pff, I don't know, because fucking Tate was suspended and then Corey Coleman goes down and it was like the wheels just came off and it was just like, we're going to, everything's gone to shit. But then you get excited from watching preseason. You're like, we're going, we're, we're going to the playoffs. <laughs> so, and I know they do this every year, but it's, it just feels different this year. It just feels different. It feels like we're on the right path. Even if we don't win a ton of ball games, I think we're going to be way more competitive than we were last year for four quarters as opposed to three. The Giants signed Graham Gano, which is great because I was not happy with the Chandler kind of, kind of Zaro, whatever his name is. I was not pleased with that signing. I was kind of like, what? This guy missed three extra points against us. He has better numbers than Chandler, and he's the one who drilled that 63-yarder to beat us against uh, when we were in Carolina a couple years ago, which that was just like, God damn it, dude. 2018, our record does not show it, but like we had a couple games that were very winnable that could have gone our way. Carolina being one, and then the, I think the Philly game as well. Very happy to have Gano back. He did not play last year and did not kick, but uh, and he's he's 33, so he's a little on the older side, but uh, it sounds like he's in shape and and he's had he has better numbers as an older kicker than Chandler does as a younger kicker. So uh, I like that signing better than I did the Chandler signing. Kind of that all. Uh, I believe this is this article is from Larry Brown Sports. Uh, five NFL teams that could surprise in 2020. The Falcons were number five. Hmm. Okay. They just, uh, they got Todd Gurley. They have Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley. Obviously, I have Matt Ryan. What, two years from playoffs? Going to the playoffs multiple times, I think. Two years, three years. They went to the Super Bowl not so long ago. So I don't know that's that surprising, but in a, in, I think what's more surprising is it's, I mean, that fucking division is just stacked. You know, you got to think that the Saints and the Bucks are probably playoff teams. I'm not sure how things operate with the Panthers and Matt Rule, but, you know, there was a lot of hype behind Matt Rule. I think a lot of Giants fans thought we were going to get him. Who knows what he's able to get out of that squad. I know most of the players were the, were sad that uh, that Rivera left or was fired, but Rule seems to have things under control. No longer have Cam Newton, but they have Teddy Bridgewater, Christian McCaffrey, obviously. Uh, is arguably not better than Saquon. Sorry, I can't say it. I can't say it. I can't say it. I mean, he's done wonders for me. Christian's done wonders for me on my fantasy football team, but I can't say it. Broncos are number four. Okay. Drew Locke. Drew Locke insanity going on in Denver, but they have Pat Shermer now, so I don't know (laughs) how that's going to turn out. Is it going to be like 2017 Minnesota Vikings or is it going to be like 2019 Giants? Washington football team. This is an interesting one. This is very interesting because I feel like they got Chase Young, even though Chase Young 
had to sit out because of a hip flexor thing. So who knows how long that takes place. So Washington football team, they changed their kind of branding, their logo, their uniforms. There's kind of a new sense of hope there. Their defensive line obviously stacked, but like not a lot of options at wide receiver, not a lot of options in secondary. Dwayne Haskins has gotten bulked up a little bit, gotten stronger. Ron Rivera could bring some consistency and stability there. Not as toxic as an environment as it was under Gruden. I still don't see it. Darius Geis released from the team for domestic violence. And then it just came out that he like raped two, two women his freshman year at LSU in 2016, I think. I don't know. I think they got a lot of issues going on both on and off the field. That could be distractions. We'll see what Rivera has to do. Game riverboat run. And then number two, the Giants. Here's the excerpt from the article. Are the Giants finally nearing the end of their seemingly endless rebuild? The young core of the team looks exciting on paper, but there are still some depth issues New York must overcome. What we see of the Giants in 2020 won't be the best of what's coming, but it could be enough to surprise many across the NFL landscape. The Giants have retooled and repaired their much maligned offensive line, finally adding a playmaking linebacker and added some much needed veteran experience and youthful speed to their secondary. So long as players like Golden Tate, Daniel Jones, Saquon Barley, Evan Ingram, and Jabril Peppers can stay on the field, the Giants have a good chance to compete for an NFC East title. Whoa! Did not expect that ending to that. <laughs> to that. I'm sorry. I was expecting like a wild card, you know, something like that. <laughs> I was not expecting a division title. And then number one is Miami. I don't hate it. They played tough against some big teams last year, some tough teams last year. New England, are they going to be the same with Cam Newton under center, calling signals in the huddle? Uh, A lot of opt-outs, especially on defense. So are the Bills going to take a step forward? So I could see Miami making the playoffs. Is Wayne Gallman, the giant, most likely to be traded? What's insane is Dave Gettleman came in and he cleaned out. He cleaned house big time. Uh, I saw a tweet that was like, the only remaining players from the Jerry Reese era are Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram, Dalvin Tomlinson, and Wayne Gallman. Four players. To be honest, I mean, and, you know, obviously Gettleman gave Shepard an extension, so I think he likes him a lot. I think they like Ingram enough to give him that fifth year option. Tomlinson is one of the best run stoppers and can also get off the get after the quarterback. So I I I can I hope he sticks, sticks around with the team and doesn't bolt uh, uh, bolt for another. And then it's Gallman. His rookie season, he. He played fairly well, got a lot of playing time, and then Shermer comes in, and uh, he saw less and less time in 2018 and 2019, uh, which I thought was a mistake. Obviously, Gallman had some ball control issues, ball security issues, and instead of trying to maybe coach him up, I mean, who knows? I wasn't in, I wasn't in the clubhouse. I wasn't on the practice field. Who knows what Shermer and his staff were trying to do, but I have more confidence in Joe, Joe Judge coming to Gallman and say, we want you in the game and playing, but you cannot fumble the ball. And you also have to stay healthy. So, and I've heard some good, I mean, you know, they, the running's back, the new running backs coach, I think it is, someone from the staff said that Wayne Gallman is constantly seeking, is, is a hard worker. Oh, I guess, yeah, he also coached, coached against him in college and saw his work ethic in college and knows that he's always seeking to get better. So I honestly think it's too early to throw in the towel on Wayne Gallman. But at the same time, they did bring in Deion Lewis. Do they see him as the third back? And it's like, if you also have Eli Penny with a potential another running back as for depth, then yeah, that would present an opportunity to be traded to a running back hungry team. What could you get for him? Pfft, fuck if I know. Uh, hopefully not a seventh rounder. <laughs> Too many of those seventh rounders coming in. And uh, we talked a little bit about how Judge is running practice. The media is making a big deal about the training camp jerseys are don't have names on them. And I thought he he just has the perfect it's it's like it's almost like he during his downtime figures out like these perfect answers to to any every possible question they could possibly face. And he, I mean, he had to know that like you're gonna take the names out the practice jerseys, which that has never been done or hasn't been done in a long time that you're expecting that question. So he probably prepared, prepared for it, but he, he nailed it. And he said, I don't want our coaches looking at a, at a player by their name and having that attachment to the name and a preconception that goes along with the name. I want them to look at the player for their abilities and how they play the game. 
I think that's, I, I, I mean, I butchered it. I'm paraphrasing, but that's very nice. I like that a lot. The, the latest news, Giants wide receiver Cody Core is believed to have torn his Achilles per source, a non-contact injury during uh, practice. He will miss the season on IR. Giants were hiring Core, who signed a two-year deal this offseason, expecting him to be a special teams ace and contributor at receiver. So, yeah, that that hurts. You know, a lot of people say, yeah, it doesn't hurt that much. And it's like, well, maybe not at the wide receiver position. I don't know that he was going to make a ton of plays there. But a lot of punts down inside the five, inside the 10 that are all Cody, all Cody Core's doing. That does affect the game. It does change the face of the game a lot of times. You know, uh, I can point to Renee Thompson with the 90 Giants. Him being an ace, a gunner on that team, and being able to down the ball inside the five, inside the 10. You pin the other, it's a field position game and when you pin the other team back in their own end zone in their own red zone like that multiple times a game during crucial situations and they can't get out of it you're getting the ball at midfield and you're already in a good position to make a play or two and at least be in field goal range so is it that crucial you know maybe no but at the same time it's a big loss in my opinion it's still a big loss so they gotta they gotta rely on some other guys to step up and be the guy that can get down there and down it because if you don't the other team starts at the 20 and they feel a lot better about uh, their their attack and their game plan 